Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Can you hear me all right? You're the man, Pastor Jeff. Actually, Pastor Hawkins is the man. I don't want to get beat up after the service, so <laughs> give honor where honor is due to the man. But hey, I'm super excited to be with you this morning. Sorry about my deeper voice. Uh, I've been a little sick this week, so thank you for your prayers. But I feel like God has placed something on my heart for us this morning. He kind of threw me an audible, and I'm hoping to execute it better than the Vikings execute audibles. So uh, we're on a Red Letters series about the words of Jesus and the importance of it, and I was going to teach on the Lord's Prayer and how that it's a powerful template that Jesus gives and teaches us for prayer, and God, like I said, kind of switched it up on me, and so this is just me being obedient to the Holy Spirit and, and where He's leading me this morning, uh, but I want to talk about God the Father, God our Father in heaven this morning. Uh, actually, my kind of on the theme of parents, my wonderful mother-in-law is here this morning, so everyone wave to Julie, she's sitting right there, she's awesome, love that she's here. I'm still working on my father-in-law, Jim. He doesn't love me enough to come down here, so no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Everyone's like, dang, we're getting real this morning. Yeah, we are. So no, I love that whole fam. And then my mom and my dad are watching online, and so um, super thankful for them and their support of me over the years. I, um, and specifically, talking about fathers this morning, my dad is awesome. One thing that stuck out to me of my dad is he, I've never seen his upper lip clean. It has always been filled with a mustache. Ever since I can remember, from the beginning of time, my dad has had a mustache. Now it's changed over the years. It grew handlebars for a short period of time with a little bit of a permed mullet in the back. So I, I was thinking about going to that look, but I don't know if my wife would love me anymore. Maybe. Now it may be a little gray, but I've always wanted to be like my dad, and so even growing up and not having any facial hair, I always tried to grow a mustache because I wanted to be like my dad. But I knew for my license picture when I turned 18, I was like, that's a long license before I have to up, you know, I get multiple years with that license, so I'm gonna make it a good picture. So I brought that to you this morning. Uh, <laughs> it's a real picture with my own little mustache. It is real, 100% authentic, curled on the ends. Took me about five years to grow, but it's there. Just wanted to be like my dad. So I, so that was when I was 18, but I got, when I got hired at New Hope like six years ago, I, all through college, Pastor Zach and I, we had mustaches. We just thought it was the best thing in the world. And when I came down, I had a mustache, and Pastor told me, you're a creep. I'm not going to hire you unless you shave it. So I had to shave it. Uh, so I had to grow a beard just to, did he say he still thinks I'm a creep? Maybe That's true, you told me I looked like a creep and I had to shave it. And I was like, oh, so this is how it's going to be working under Pastor Weaver, all right. I know what I'm signing up for at least, but um, as Christians, uh, we, it's no out there fact, it's not a foreign thing to hear a Christian pray Heavenly Father. Pray, God, God, my Father, God in heaven, our Father, even if you're reciting the Lord's Prayer. It's a very common theme, as you hear, it's just, it's in our rhetoric, it's what we use as Christians, but believe it or not, as God was kind of working on this with me, you know, I kind of was like, well, what, I, want, I would love to trace that back, uh, you know, in the history of that, of us calling God the Father. And in fact, in Old Testament times, um, that wouldn't have been a normal statement at all. In fact, it would be borderline offensive. It would be rather of an insane statement for me to address God in the first person as my father. Uh, it would be very radical. In the Old Testament, as I did some research, uh, God was rarely referred to as the father in the first person. Rarely was he, I mean, not in the first person, just rarely as a whole, as father. It, he, we know he's called father of the nation of Israel, as the nation as the whole, the father of the nation. But that was less than 10 times in the whole Old Testament. It was actually less than five times that God was called the father of certain individuals. Once again, it was still in the third person, like King David, who's called the father of King David. 
And the father imagery that God has for his people, once again, was a handful of times, but never the term father was, wasn't even used in those times. And uh, in fact, German scholar uh, Hermias discovered that in his research of, of researching the entire history of Judaism and all the ex- existing books of the Old Testament and all the existing uh, extra biblical Jewish writings outside of the Bible that were dating back to the beginning of Judaism up until the 10th century, there is not a single reference of a Jewish person addressing God directly in the first person as my father or our father. I find that so interesting. Not a single reference. Now there were appropriate forms uh, to address God that were often high in reverence, high in respect, in this healthy fear, even down to young children, that's what they were trained to call God um, in these other terms. And none of those titles for God included father. Actually, if we fast forward into the New Testament, the first recorded Jew to address God directly in the first person as father was Jesus. And actually was when Jesus was a young boy. And and in fact, it was the first recorded words that we even see of Jesus. He refers to his father in the first person. If you know the story, he's lost in the temple. His parents can't find him. And he says, I was in the temple doing my father's business. First time we see it even recorded. Jesus was the first one to address God as his father. And we know sitting here as Christians, well, duh, he's the son of God. He's the son of the father. But Jesus made this a, a, not just a plus add-on theme to things or to add to make things more intricate or intimate, but it was a main theme that Jesus used in his ministry. We see him as he's ministering to people and mainly in prayers Um, that he references God as Father. In fact, every prayer that we have recorded of him, uh, except for one prayer, he's referencing God as his Father in the first person. He uses Father, God the Father, 66 times in the Synoptic Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and over 100 times in John. He uses Abba Father, which is a more intimate It's kind of been romanticized that Abba, Father, means more of like a childish, like, daddy, but that's not necessarily the case. It still means Father. There's still the reverence there, but it it, it implies just on that much more intimate, Abba, Father. We see this three times in the New Testament, all during prayer. Specifically, one instance in Jesus right before his death, and he's crying out to his Abba, Father, in the Garden of Gethsemane. What an intimate picture. And we see in John 5, 18, that because Jesus was using this rhetoric, he was using God the Father as first person, that this was the very reason that the Jews, especially the Pharisees and Sadducees, wanted to kill him. In John 5, 18, that is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. Now, Jesus does two things and makes this statement so radical of calling God the Father. It does two things for him. It shows us that he is the Son of God. That means that he is God. He is, it's, it's, it's a deity claim, which is why it would have been offensive. But also, it would have been offensive because of the nature of how intimate calling God in the first person as my Father would have been. It, it wasn't that way. It wasn't even culturally that way, much less religiously. So you can see the shock and awe factor of Jesus coming on the scene, and he's constantly saying it. He's constantly saying, God, my Father, God, our Father, the Father. But he doesn't just stop there. In, in his ministry, Jesus is saying, I, God is my Father, but he's also saying, we, as a church and his disciples, we need to reference God as our Father. In Matthew 6, 9, it says, this then is how you should pray. This is how you should talk to God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The start of the Lord's Prayer. He's saying you need to connect with God, uh, or he, he isn't saying a, a way that you connect with God is, through the, is in the, the sense of a father, son, or daughter relationship. He's saying it's the way to connect with God. It is the way to connect with God is saying you are my Father. Speaking of intimacy, John chapter 10, verse 15, says, even as the Father knows me, I 
and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. Matthew 26, 39 says, And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face, this is Jesus, and prayed, saying, My Father, Abba, Father, if it is, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Why is it so important? Why did Jesus choose this? It's intentional. I know it's intentional. To speak so intimately and call God Father, to connect in everything that he did, especially in prayer with God the Father. I think that's important for us today, and I want to break down why that's important. Like I said, I love my dad. I have a great relationship with him, but I wasn't a perfect child, and I know there were some points in that relationship where I had a little bit of a, oh no, my dad's going to kill me moments. Has anyone else, anyone a sinner in this place? Oh no, my dad, my parent is going to kill me moments. I've had just a few in my life, and uh, a couple of them, um, me and my younger brother, Levi, two years younger than me, we were out playing in the snow, and I accidentally hit him in the face with a shovel. (laughs) And... uh, It was weird how I hit him. I hit him horizontally with the shovel, and it actually split his nose open right here, cut across his nose. So when that happened, I turned, and it was like, oh, no, my dad's going to kill me. Moment. I I also, um, we lived in in the woods, and so I was obsessed with, like, booby traps or catching animals with traps. And so I thought, well, I'll make one in my home, see see who I'll catch. And I thought... uh, I found some toothpicks, and in the carpeted stairs, I placed the toothpicks straight up and down to see what I could capture. It worked, and I captured my sister, and she stepped on one of them, and it went right through her foot. Uh, That was a, uh, that toothpick's going to get used on me. I'm going to get stabbed. Uh, In high school, a couple of my buddies and I, I don't condone this at all, we skipped, we skipped school, we skipped class, and we loved golf, so we thought, let's Let's go play golf. It's way, way more fun than school. Well, we were on like the second or third hole, and I kid you not, this is a true story. We're teeing off, and we see behind us that the foursome behind us, directly behind us, on the hole behind us, is our principal, the, the pastor of the school, and a couple faculty, the foursome behind us. I kid you not. And we're, our four students are skipping class going, four, you know, just yelling. At, uh, it was, I thought, oh, my dad's going to kill me for this. There was one instance where uh, a couple of our, our cars had gotten, you know, as a joke, kind of a, as a prank, a little bit vandalized, and I always had a motto in high school that I, I don't prank to start, I prank to end. Uh, and so we thought, all right, this girl, she pranked our cars, we're going we're gonna to end this. And so we had raked a bunch of leaves, and we're going to go mess with her car, and on the way over there, I saw something coming up in the road, and I was like... I think that's a dead possum. Let's grab it. So we grabbed this giant dead possum. My buddy was driving. We had the, it was an Astro van and the sliding door. And I held the possum out the door because it stunk so bad as we drove there. And we, we saran wrapped this, this possum to this girl's car. And uh, prayer does work. And her, her doors were unlocked. And so then we filled her car with leaves. And that was not good. And we got caught, and I thought, man, my, my dad is going to kill me for this. Uh, that was actually yesterday that that happened. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it was Susan's car. So, no, I did, yeah. Pa- Daddy Pastor Weaver is going to kill me. Uh, some of you are like, man, this sinner up here. Yes, I've had these moments. But uh, there was one instance where... I was, I was leaving a uh, game film uh, on a, a school day, and it was before, we'd do it before class would start, and I was driving, it was super icy, and I had some guys in the car, I wasn't, you know, like fully paying attention, as high schoolers do, and I slipped on the ice, and I, I kind of clipped one of my buddy's cars in front of me, and it like kind of took out the left side of my, uh, my, uh, my hood was kind of bent a little, it was just not good, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do here? My, like, wheel was kind of, like, not working, and I was scared, like, my car, I had a 97 Jeep Cherokee, so it was, like, already a piece of junk, um, but I had a moment there where I thought, I, I had kind of a fork in the road, I got, I had to decide, is, is this a moment where, 
oh, my dad's going to kill me, or is it, I need to call my dad, I'm in trouble. And those two different, whatever I choose in that situation, depending on my response, really shows and reveals a lot about my relationship with my dad, doesn't it? If my only response ever is my dad is going to kill me, that reveals a lot about my relationship and how I see him. But on the opposite hand, if I, my first instinct is when I'm in need, when I'm in trouble, when there's something going on, when there's something bigger than me, I need wisdom, I need this or I need that. If my first response is to go, help, I'm going to call my dad. That shows also a lot about my relationship. And I think as Christians, we oftentimes with things that happen in us, to us, or around us, we get to these moments with God the Father where we can decide which way to choose. And that reveals a lot about our relationship with God. Because it's, I believe it's true, sometimes how you see God is how you receive from God. I think the lens at which we perceive God and we see God the Father, if we see, think about this, if we see him as rule keeper, as distant, as non-intimate, as the punisher, as the judge, the silent, the unfaithful, the powerless, the unloving, if I see God in those lights, I'm going to receive very differently from him. I'm not going to be able to receive love from a God that I, doesn't, I don't think loves. Does it make sense? But on the opposite, if I'm in need or I have something and I go, God is my healer. He is there for me. He is all knowing. He is all powerful. He's my guidance. He's my correction. I'm going to receive from God a lot differently and, and a lot more powerfully if I can look at God as my father and go, he's the one I go to for help. Make sense? Is everyone tracking with me here? How we see God affects how we re- can receive from God. And these views of God can change so much about how we let him work in our lives. And I believe in this place, and I've been praying for you this week, there's people in this place that you have from your past or your present, you have horrible relationships with your earthly fathers. Absent fathers, forsaking fathers, deadbeat dads, passed away fathers, and there's hurt from that. And it's hard for you to grasp the the sense of God my heavenly father. And just so we know this morning that the earthly father doesn't set the example. Our heavenly father not only sets the example, but he sets the standard. That some people, the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you and reveal to you in this place that you have been applying an earthly example to the heavenly standard that God has set. And it's skewing your, your view, and it's, you're having a hard time receiving things that God wants to do in you and through you. And he wants to reveal that this morning and heal that. God the Father wants to connect with you. He's in this place, and he wants to show you this morning who he really is. But I want to challenge us this morning going forward that when we truly realize and go to God as the Father, just like Jesus commanded, it can change everything for us. It changes everything, especially our prayer lives. And I believe that there's two things specifically that I'll highlight out of the many. Two things that seeing and going to God as our Father give us. The first thing is confidence. Turn your neighbor and say confidence. Going to God gives us confidence. See, if you have been a kid once, or you have kids currently, or you know one, a kid does not have a problem asking for something that they need. Hello. They don't have a problem. They have, a lot of times, a little too much confidence going for a need that they have, asking their father, asking a parent for things that they need, and they'll believe it's done. They know it should be done. It should, it should happen. If I ask it, it should be good. It, there's just such a trust there. It's automatic. It's not even, it, 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 children, I love the childlike faith. It's not even a, a decision to trust. It, it, it's just, They do. They do trust. They don't even have to decide to trust or choose to trust. They don't have to try. See, a child can ask a father what nobody else can ask. A child can ask a father what nobody else can ask. Think about this. The worst dictator, the most violent cartel leader, these notorious, bigwig, tough guys, violent, 
if they have a little kid that says in the middle of the night, I need some water, are they going to say no to that kid? No. No. I, I actually heard a story about Pablo Escobar was on the run. He's, the, the, you know, the, the most, one of the most notorious, one of the most violent, one of the most wealthy, uh, you know, drug smuggled cartel leaders of all time in the history of the world. And he's on the run with his wife and his kids, and his daughter's young at this point. And the story goes that his daughter says, Daddy, I'm cold. Daddy, help, like, make me warm. And without hesitation, Pablo starts to burn two million dollars to keep her warm. Just for one night. Just two million. A child can ask a father what nobody else can ask. We have that ask, access, and we should have that confidence that we can go to our Heavenly Father. To our Heavenly Father. See, if fathers will do things for their kids that they won't do for anyone else, and kids will ask their fathers for things that they can't ask anyone else. In John 16, 23, at that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. This is Jesus talking. At that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you, you will ask the Father directly, and he will grant your requests because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Like I just illustrated, it's not a cultural or a religious thing of Judaism. <laughs> you haven't done this before, but ask using my name and you will receive and you will have abundant joy. Hebrews 4 says and illustrates that we can enter, quote, boldly into the throne room of grace. What a beautiful picture of going to the Father, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the all-powerful, the almighty, the all-creating one. But we get to go to him as son or daughter. How powerful is that? How powerful is that for our prayer life? We can ask the Father directly through Jesus. In fact, as a kid, it went even farther than just the confidence to ask, but it gives such a confidence in who we're asking. I'm at, I, I can ask my dad that. My dad knows everything. He's a superhero. He's this strong. I wanted to be my dad so much, I grew a mustache. Like I, I, we, I loved my dad. He could do anything. And I can ask him for anything, and I believe he's going to do it. How much more with Jesus? How much more with through Jesus' name that we get to ask God the Father? Jesus in Matthew 18 teaches the disciples humility. He teaches them faith like a child. That trust, dependence, and absolute need of the Father. He says, you need to have faith like that. Like a kid going to his dad. And PC up here, Pastor Courtney, was pretty much preaching my message. That even your kids today, as they're, they, I love being up there and seeing them worship and seeing them pray and seeing them celebrate what God is doing like it's supposed to be. Like a father or daughter should be celebrating because that's who God is. That's what he does. So why should we believe any different as sons or daughters? But once again, if I don't believe I'm a son or daughter or that God's my father, it makes sense why I don't believe him for who he is. Or, or take him by his word. My father can do it. I'm not surprised because he can do it. He's my provider. He's my healer. He's abundantly faithful, fiercely loving. That's the God I go to. That's the God I can ask. All powerful, all knowing, ever present. We just went to our healing father this morning. That he can do it. But I believe sometimes people, especially Christians, don't see God as father, they see him as employer. Okay, God, I clocked in this Sunday, picking up an extra shift Wednesday night, put in my hours this week, I did this for you, I sacrificed this for you, and you know, as my employer, I, I deserve some professional reimbursement. That'd be nice, God. You owe me this, and you owe me this. And as, as a boss, you pay up. You better do it. And if you don't, you're a horrible boss. It's not intimate. Sometimes they don't see God as father. They see God as genie. Ha <laughs> ha, I just discovered you, God, all powerful. Sweet. I can ask whatever I want. Heck yeah. When it doesn't happen, oh, prayer doesn't work. God doesn't care. He's not all-powerful, because I asked him, and he didn't do it. That's not a relationship of a father to a son or a father to a daughter. See, children, 
even when the answer is no or there's, there's something that adults are doing, children understand that there's things they won't understand. They just get it. Their minds are at that place. And so if God says no to me, my response will be very different once again if I'm, I'm asking from an employer or a genie versus a son or a daughter. Because if he says no, or it's not the way I want, or something's going this or this, I can still trust a father. Can't always trust a boss for my best interest. Can't always trust an employer. Can't always trust a genie, because it's not intimate. Do you see how powerful that'll change our prayer lives? Do you see how powerful that'll change when we go through hardship? That I go to God as my father, the confidence that I can have going to him and who he is. Luke 11 says, you fathers, if your children ask for a fish, Do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. You sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? The Father gives good gifts. He knows that that, 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 what to give you, when to, to give you it, and how you need it. He knows it better than earthly fathers do. He knows, in fact, everything good is from God. Everything good is from God. That's what the Bible says. And then we can have a confidence, even if, like I said, even if it doesn't go my way, that God is still a good, good father. And that he loves me and cares about me. I love at the end of this verse, it says, talking about gifts, but then it says, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? This is how good God, how good of a giver that God is. We ask for help, he gave us the helper. We ask for comfort, he gave us the comforter. We ask for a gift, he gave us the giver himself. We ask for a loan, he gave us the bank. We, we ask for power, he gave us the power plant. Do you see how good of a gift that is to get the Holy Spirit, how intimate that is from a father to a son or daughter? And recognizing who we are to the father, it'll change your prayer life. Think about how you go and you get in your prayer time alone and you sit there in the presence of a heavenly father versus a distant God or a deity. Changes everything. Changes what you ask and how you believe it. And I know and we know that if we change, if that'll change our prayer life, it'll change our whole lives because our prayer lives will change everything. It's confidence. The second thing besides confidence that we get from God the Father is connection. Turn your neighbor and say connection. This is one of the most beautiful things that I love about this piece of God, the Father, and the connection that it brings, the access, if you will. And Jesus knew that we can't look to earthly examples of the Father, so he taught a parable. He gave a story on one, a hypothetical. That one is funny, that wouldn't happen in that day. We like to call it the prodigal son but I think it really should be called the parable of the loving father or the father's heart. Most of us know it. If you don't, I'm sure you've heard of it. Story of a very powerful, prestigious, wealthy landowner who's a father of two. The younger one comes to his dad and says, I want my inheritance. I want what's due to me. Legally in that day, he could do that. The son could go to his dad and say, I get one-third, older brother gets two-thirds, and I want my one-third now. I don't want to wait till you're dead. But that would be a huge no-no. There would be a gasp there amongst his audience of Pharisees and sinners alike, because they know that would be like this son going to his father and saying, I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead. It would be a slap in the face. It would be the ultimate sign of disrespect. But the father says, all right, all right, I'll give it to you. Son goes to a distant land and through wild living, the Bible says, and partying and, 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 and gluttonous and drunkery and all that stuff, this son finds himself in a desperate place where he's serving pigs and he's jealous of what the pigs are eating. And he thinks, man, you know what, I, I could go back to my father, but not as a son, I could go back as a servant. I'm not really a son anymore. I've kind of disqualified myself from that. I could go as a servant. I could go as a slave. We'll see. I'm just going to go and try. So the son makes his way desperate, and we pick it up in Luke 15, verses 20. So he returned home to his father. 
while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. That speaks to me so much that the father was always looking, waiting, praying, hoping that the son would just turn. The father sees you this morning. No matter where you're at, he sees you from a long way off. You may feel like you're a long way off, but the father's here. The father saw him coming and filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to his servants, quick, bring the finest robe in the house, put it on him, get a ring for his finger, sandals for his feet, kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. The father does not even acknowledge the attempt for this son to remove himself from from sonship. He doesn't even acknowledge it. The father recognizes that no matter what he has done, he will always be a son. No no matter what has been done to him, he will always be a son in the father's eyes. Doesn't even acknowledge it, but says we have to celebrate. Verse 24, for this son of mine was dead and now is returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Did you know, so he's, Jesus is saying this to, like I said, sinners and Pharisees alike. In that culture, the law that was given to them in Deuteronomy, and actually Deuteronomy 18, you can look it up. It's a section that is literally titled, Law for a Rebellious Son. And it is a paragraph outlining exactly what the son did. Disgrace to family, disgrace to community, uh, drunkenness, gluttonous, slothness, and, and and saying he's guilty. Then it says in Deuteronomy, a part of the law of the land, that the parents could bring this son to the community. The the community then would be able to legally stone him to death. The people listening knew this. They knew this. There was also maybe that community in that time wasn't as legalistic up to to the point of death, but at the very least, there was a, a, a ritual called the ketazah, I'm probably butchering that, It was a ceremony that same type of thing the parents would bring a a, a disrespectful, rebellious son to the community, and the community would do something, and all at the same time, they would would say together in unison, they would say, so-and-so is therefore excommunicated from the community and family. So at the very least, the son was removed from the family, no longer a son, and he was removed from the community. And on the very worst, he was killed for it. And these people knew this. The the audience knew this. And had the son been dealt according to the law, it should have been a funeral and not a feast. But that's not the heart of the father. Kenneth Bailey, a theologian who knows the Middle East, talked about it this way. He said, traditional Middle Easterners wearing long robes do not run in public. They never have. To do so would be deeply humiliating. The father knows that in so, in doing so, he will deflect the attention of the community away from his ragged son to himself. People will focus on the extraordinary sight of a distinguished, self-respecting landowner humiliating himself in public by running down the road, revealing his legs. Isn't that a beautiful picture of the gospel? Jesus was in it, was enabled by the Father to endure all the focus, all the humiliation, and all the sin to take us off of us. See, God isn't and wasn't our Father because He created us. Jesus taught that He is our Father because He redeemed us. He saved us. We're purchased by His Son, Jesus. He adopted us. One of my favorite verses, one of my favorite verses in the New Testament Ephesians 1.5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. Hallelujah for that. God wanted to adopt us, and it gave him great joy when he did. We have been adopted. Church, we have been adopted. You have been adopted into his family. We're invited not, not because we earned it, but because we're loved. 
Worship team, you can come. This is so illustrated in Romans 5. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death, death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Listen to the phrases that we get called in that. Sinners and enemies of God. Talk about the opposite of a son or a daughter. That we by our sin, we by, by just our nature have made ourselves enemies of God. But he wasn't okay with that. He loved us too much. I love that the New Testament church, that our church, that the church is called the house of God. What a beautiful picture of sons and daughters coming to the Father together as the house. They're also called the family of God. Psalm 103 illustrates this again so well. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all of our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we so deserve. For his unfailing love towards those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. So he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. Listen to me, church. The father's end goal of sending Jesus to die for us wasn't salvation. Be like, heresy. It sounds like it. But think about it, the end goal wasn't salvation, it was relationship. We could not have relationship without salvation, and we couldn't have salvation without Jesus' sacrifice. But God didn't stop at salvation, he said, I want you in my family. I'm not just gonna pay for you, I'm gonna adopt you by the blood of my own son. I want you in my family, son or daughter, because that's who you are to me, and I'm your father. What sin that, 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 that separated, sin that bridged the gap, or, or that caused the gap, caused the wall, caused the veil between us and God and this access, this connection that we can have. Jesus, his sacrifice bridged the gap. It tore the veil. It gave us access and connection with the Father, not in a sense of creation to creator, but deeper than that, than son or daughter to Father. How powerful, how life-changing and radical if we would start accepting and going to God as Father in every scenario, just as Jesus taught and commanded. Would you stand all across this place? Like I said, I've been praying this week and I believe the Holy Spirit is touching some hearts right now. Whether you are in that category of you're feeling broken from past relationships, skewed relationships, even present relationships with your Father. God wants to mend that and show you how good the Heavenly Father is. How He is as the Heavenly Father. Because He wants relationships with you. Would you close your eyes across this place? I believe there's some here this morning that you haven't assumed the identity of son or daughter. You know Jesus died for you, but you haven't given him your life and therefore be brought into the family of God, to the house of God. And the Father wants you. He's chasing after you. He sees where you are. And he's running after you with love and compassion. And if you're in this place and that, that's you, and you would say, I want to give God the Father my life. I want to be a son or daughter. I want to be made into the family, purchased by the blood that's you, would you just raise a hand and look at me so I can join with you and pray? I see that hand. Absolutely, I see you. Absolutely. I see you. God sees you. I see your hand. Absolutely. In the back. Yeah, absolutely. Praise the Lord that some sons and daughters are returning home. Back home. Welcome home. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God the Father. For the rest of us, I, I believe he's challenging us to start viewing him in the light and coming to him in the confidence and the connection through the Father, through the Father. Maybe that'll change how you worship this morning because you're worshiping the Father. Maybe that'll change how you pray this morning because you're praying to the Father. So God, we lift up your name, the name that is greater than any other name, more powerful, but God, more intimate than any other name. God, our Father in heaven, we praise you. We thank you, God, for those who raise their hands, who have now been adopted as they give their lives to you, adopted into your kingdom. And God, we thank you for the rest of us that we would be constantly reminded that we are purchased and adopted into your family, that we are sons and daughters in this place, and that changes everything in our relationship with you, in our relationship with others, and even how we view and act in this world. Everything changes now. Thank you, Father God, that you loved us so much. You didn't just stop at sacrifice, you didn't just stop at salvation, but you gave us relationship and you made it intimate by sending your Holy Spirit. We thank you, God, this morning that as we worship you just for a moment before we leave, that we would tune in to this relationship of Heavenly Father and that we are sons and daughters. We praise you, Jesus. Part of this and the Holy Spirit working on us as sons or daughters is when we walk out the door and we start operating, we start living, we start praying with our true identities, sons and daughters. So I hope you do that this week. And God the Father is going to reveal himself to you in, may, in many ways that like never before in your life. And I, I believe that. I'm speaking that over you as you go. We love you all. Love you all. God bless you this week.